Grace and peace to you on this Lord's Day. I invite you to attend our Monday night class on the saints, which is tomorrow night. You can find it on the homepage of our website at 7 p.m., or you can watch it after that as well. Dr. Mike Graves will be talking about modern saints, and this week the saint is Howard Thurman, who was a major influence on Dr. Martin Luther King's faith and public witness. As we prepare for worship, please prepare your own table by setting out bread and drink, and then take a moment to fill out the attendance form on your screen. If you are tuning in via Facebook Live, you may sign in after the service on the church website. We review the names every week, and it brings a smile to our faces to know that you were here. Let us greet our family, friends, and neighbors. Let us greet our fellow church members with signs of God's grace and peace. I invite you to now join in this morning's call to worship. Here in this place, there are no foreigners, for all are welcome in God's house. Here at this table, there are no outsiders, for all are welcome to eat with God. Here in this worship, there is only acceptance, for love is the language of our faith.
The first scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. The praise of God shall be ever in my mouth. I will glory in the Lord. Let the humble hear and rejoice. Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. Let us exalt the name of God together. I sought the Lord who answered me and delivered me out of all my terror. Look upon God and be radiant, and let not your face, faces be ashamed. I shall call in my affliction, and the Lord heard me and saved me from all my troubles. The angel of the Lord encompasses those who fear God and will deliver them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who trust in God. Good morning, children. Jesus told us sacred stories called parables. Sacred means that something is extra special. Jesus was extra special. The stories Jesus told were messages about how to love God and love each other. Let us wonder how this parable helps us love. It was the most special invitation to a really big party. Lots of people were invited. I really want to come, but I have to water my plants, one person said. I really want to come, but I need to take care of my animals, another person said. I really want to come, but I am married and need to be home, said another. So many people were just too busy to go to the party. The host of the party was mad that no one wanted to come. The host had put so much work into making it special for everyone. The host then decided to send out more special invitations. Strangers were invited. Poor people were invited. Sick people were invited. Children were invited. Those people that usually never get invited to the party were invited to the great party. God, thank you for inviting us to your big party. Help us to remember to invite others to join us. Amen. As we come to this time of prayer, you're invited to share any prayer concerns you may have by calling the prayer line or emailing the church at the information you see on your screen. Let's lift our joys and concerns to God in prayer. God of all, we hear in the century-old hymn we sing, through Christ there is one community of love throughout the whole wide world. Yet how difficult it is for humanity to live these words. We pray for empathy, seeking to understand ideas, people, situations, ourselves, our faith, our hopes, seeking, exploring the why of life, the why of who we are, seeking because we know that only by seeking do we go beyond ourselves to where answers reside, answers that we have never considered. Keep ideas, possibilities, dreams, hopes growing in and around us. Cause our attitude to change, to be invitational, Place people in our path that will cause us to grow and whom we can help grow. In this time where courage, patience, and measured guidance are needed, we pray for the leaders of our country and throughout our world. We pray for health care workers, medical professionals, and researchers. We pray for students educators, administrators, and school staff. We pray for children and parents, adults who are isolated, people separated from families. We pray for each and every child of God, for we are all yours. God, in the midst of the heaviness of the day today, when we open to your love, we realize we are also heavy with gratitude. You have blessed our lives in unimaginable ways. You have helped us dream new dreams for ourselves and our world. Grant us courage and surround us by faithful community so that we may actualize our dreams together. Grant us vision to see the glorious creation around us. As fall gives way to winter, may we pause in awe of the beauty. Grant us loving hearts that we may offer kindness, 
grace and care to each we encounter. Help us, O God, to empty ourselves of those things that hinder us from knowing the fullness of your love and fill us with those things that tend to make us all that you want us to be. We need your presence, O Creator, and being filled with your presence, may we live as one community of love throughout the whole wide world. We offer these prayers as a community, lifting our voices as one, sharing the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As the leaves fall and wrestle under our feet on these beautiful November brisk days, we're reminded that in nature, everything returns to creation to support the cycle of life. We are, do well to pause and think about our spiritual life and how it's been nurtured through the church and how we are called to participate in giving back to our spiritual community. That may be through one of our many ministries. It may be through our regular gift to the church, or it may be through a will or an estate down the road. Today, to financially support the church, you may use the text number that's on your screen now. You may use the red give button that is on our pages on the website, or you can mail us a good old fashioned check. Let the offering be received. heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens and lay down your shame. And all who are broken, lift up your face.
your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are, come as you are. Today we conclude our sermon series on the stained glass windows of our church focusing on the Christ window. The reading is from Luke 7, yet another one of Luke's many stories in which we find references to Jesus eating. Only in this case, his lifestyle is contrasted with that of John the baptizer. Listen to what God might be saying to you. Luke 7, 31 through 35. To what then will I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Nevertheless, wisdom is vindicated by all her children. When I taught at the seminary, I used to tell my students in preaching class, there are four Gospels, and most preachers have one sermon. And both parts of that needed clarification. What I meant by four Gospels was that there's variety. They don't do it the same way, which meant that preachers didn't have to preach like their senior minister that they heard growing up. For example, in the Gospel of Luke where we are today, Jesus tells parables all the time. Early on in his journeys, some of them unique to Luke, they're everywhere. But the Gospel of John, where we were the last three weeks, Not one parable. Variety. As for the one sermon, I didn't mean it literally, but metaphorically. The idea being that every preacher would have to find her own voice, her own style, her her one message that would kind of be her passion and her ministry. When I think about the gospel writers, I think about Mark, who came first, and, and he's got his own style. He decides not to tell the story of the birth of Jesus. He decides not to have the resurrected Jesus even appear. And then Matthew comes along, and he has a copy of Mark, and he uses a little bit of it, but then he he says, look, you can't have a gospel without the birth of Jesus and, and without him showing up resurrected, and so Matthew's is different. Or as Carla said about the Gospel of John a few weeks ago, If you could summarize it in one word, it would be life. It's in the Gospel of John that he says, I'm the resurrection and the life, or I've come that they might have life. That's his one sermon. If you had to figure out what Luke's one sermon was, if you had to summarize the Gospel in one word, what would it be? I think the clue is in the text that we read and in the window that we're looking at today. Over the past few weeks, we've had those videos up front at the beginning of the worship service that have testimonials about favorite windows. I'm told that the St. Cecilia window got the most votes. There may be a recount, in effect, I don't know. But I loved Jackie's testimonial last week. She was referencing the window in the chapel and the Christ's hands and how she could imagine herself in those hands. We've had all those videos, and I I started wondering, what if we had recorded Luke out there on the lawn and asked him, so what's your favorite window? We could bring him inside, socially distanced, with a mask on. That would be good for the apostle, right? And we would say, so what do you think? And I'm pretty sure we would want to point him to these south windows where Luke has his own window. But here's my hunch. I think he would keep looking at the chancel window. I think this would be his favorite. In part, because there's the Christ with the right hand raised in 
benediction. Preachers have been copying it ever since. But it's his left hand. You see it? He's holding a loaf of bread. In fact, if you had to summarize the gospel of Luke in one word, I think it'd be bread or food or eating or something like that. I mean, if they'd put it up to us, we probably would have said he should hold scrolls in that hand. You know, maybe have Alpha and Omega on it or maybe the keys to the kingdom before he hands them over to Peter. But no, he's holding bread. And in fact, except for two side panels, the whole window is about bread. Across the bottom, three panels of the Last Supper. Only it turns out it wasn't the Last Supper. Because in the upper right is the story of Jesus eating with that couple back in their home in Emmaus. And he's still eating with us. And the Last Supper wasn't, of course, the first supper because Jesus was always eating. In the upper left panel, he's feeding the multitudes. Bread, bread, everywhere you look in the life of Jesus. That's why that scholar penned that line that we had there on the opening slide of this morning's worship. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is either at a meal, going to a meal, or coming home from a meal. But it's not just that in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus eats a lot. Luke has a foodie vocabulary. Here's the way I would explain it. If you happened into our house when the TV was on, if I had the remote, it's probably on the Golf Channel. This week is the Masters. But if my wife had the remote, it's probably on Food Network. And you know, they have all those cooking shows, and they use so many French terms, so much of a cooking vocabulary, like a sous chef, or mise en place, or saute, all of them French words. Well, Luke didn't know French, but he knew Greek. In fact, his Greek is the most sophisticated of all the writers of the New Testament, and he uses, get this, 45 different words for food and cooking and feasting. It's everywhere. This is the Food Network gospel. So it's no surprise that when you get to this passage, there's a reference to food. What's surprising is how it's framed. It's the distinction made between the ministry of Jesus and his cousin, John the baptizer. John is presented as an ascetic, which is just a fancy term for someone who lead, leads a monk-like life. He, he doesn't indulge in the finer things of life, especially food. You remember what he ate, right? Locusts? They weren't dipped in dark chocolate. Jesus, on the other hand, is presented as one who feasts. And the way the contrast comes about is with reference to a children's game. They didn't have Nintendo back then. You had to be creative. So sometimes kids played a game called Wedding. And if you played Wedding, there should be music and dancing. And other times they played Funeral. And if you were at a funeral, you pretended to be sad. The ministry of Jesus is presented by Luke as Wedding, as Feast. Is feasting on bread. But here's the real scandal of the text. It is not that Jesus eats a lot, glutton and drunkard, but with whom? Friend of sinners was meant as an insult, but I think he wore that moniker with pride. The very next story after this, he goes to the home of a man named Simon, who happens to be a Pharisee. We would say an elder or a deacon in the church. But the dinner's interrupted when a sinful woman enters. Sinful meaning she doesn't observe Jewish law. She's not keeping the law. And Jesus is comfortable in the presence of both. It's only in Luke's gospel that Jesus eats with Pharisees, but he welcomes everybody. He does not feel the need to choose between the two. And just this week, that thought haunted me. I was taken back immediately to something that still bothers me to this day, 
Freshman year in college, you've heard me tell it before, is when I came to faith. Before that, high school, college, my life was, it was about partying, drugs, a lot of drinking. Well, when I came to faith, this college group at the church, they took me in, and I remember telling them, oh my gosh, there's this great place in town that has some of the best nachos ever. We got to go there. And we loaded up and we went. And while we were waiting to get in, they saw this sign over the door. It said, spirits served here. Well, all my friends in high school and before I came to faith, they would have told you that just means there's beer and I hope there is because we're having nachos. But these church friends looked at that, looked at each other, and they saw nothing but evil, that there were evil spirits here. And the message that they sent my way was, you, you shouldn't be in a place like this and you shouldn't have friends who are in a place like this. And I took it to heart and I walked away from all my old friends. It was a big mistake. And it reminded me of a Craddock story. I, I've probably told you this one before, but like I said, preachers only have one sermon. Fred Craddock, in the very first church he served, he was still in Bible college, and it was out in a rural place, and just a few families, they, almost everybody was related, they would come on Sundays, but then some big construction project came into the area. Maybe it was building a dam or some such thing. And so, you know, not all of those people that were in construction were church going, but a lot of them were. And out of that sprung up mobile home camp, here they came, some of them, on church, on Sunday to church. And, and after church one Sunday, they had an elder meeting and the members of the board said to Fred, we got to do something about all these people coming to our church. And he said, I know, it's wonderful, isn't it? And he said, no, no, no. I make a motion. Unless you're a longtime property owner in this county, you can't come to this church. And Fred spoke against it, and they reminded him he was a preacher boy, and it passed. And years, years later, Fred and his wife Nettie were in that part of the state, and they decided on a Sunday morning they'd see if they could find that old church. And they did. And the parking lot was full. Cars and trucks, motorcycles everywhere. And a sign that said, barbecue restaurant, all you can eat. And they were hungry, so they went in. Why not? What had been a pulpit was where the hostess stood. How many in your party? What had been a table with bread and wine now had sauces on it and pickles and onions. And you sat on a pew while they waited for them to call your name. And finally they were eating and Fred looked around at all these people. And he said, you know, it's a good thing this isn't a church anymore or else all these people couldn't be here. Who belongs at the table of God? One of those shows that my wife watches, and I, I really like this one, it's called Best Thing I Ever Ate. They have these celebrity chefs and food critics on, and there'll be a theme for the day. You know, like maybe it's dessert, and, and for me, it's got to be this New York-style cheesecake I had at Eileen's in Manhattan. It's unbelievable. Or maybe they'll do something savory like Best Tacos, and for me, it's the street tacos at a little place called Taco Guild in Phoenix. That and their Mexican street corn. It's to die for or to live for. But here's the best part. Not just the food. It's in an old church. It's an old Methodist church that had gone under. But they didn't just... But, well, they respected the place. They, they respectfully repurposed it is what they call it. They, they kept the door to the church. You enter through it. They kept some, or, or put some uh, shadow boxes on the wall with memorabilia and photos from the church. But best of all, they kept the windows, stained glass windows. And there's this one that says, now you are God's people. Now you are God's people. I love that image because on any day of the week, any night. The crowd is this incredible mix. Former hippies and hipsters. 
third graders and retired. It's Phoenix, after all, gay and straight. I mean, you get the idea, this incredible diverse group. And here is this light shining through a window that says, now you are God's people. Just last week, I read this New Testament scholar who compares reading the Gospels to looking through stained glass. And he does it so in two ways. He says, in some ways, yeah, you can see the story, whatever's being told, but you can see through a window. Not not clear because it's stained glass, but you, you know there's something back there. And for me, behind this chance of window is a world. All of those people, God's people, welcome at the table. The other way, he says, is it's kind of like a mirror, though. I mean, you you don't see yourself clearly, but you can. I picture us standing in front of this Christ in the window. In his left hand, bread. But it's his right hand. It's the hand of blessing or benediction. And for every couple who has stood here, Christ is blessing them. And for every funeral, Christ blessing those who mourn. And every Sunday, in this room or on tape, Christ blessing us. But I have to be honest with you. The more I've looked at that hand, it's not raised in benediction. And (laughs) I hope this doesn't offend you. It almost looks to me like he's waving waving us and welcoming us to the party of God. And all are welcome. In some churches, you need to be a member of the church to approach the communion table and receive the bread and the wine. My sister's friend is married to a man who's a member of one of those type of churches. The wife is not a member, and she's never quite sure when they go to church what to do when it comes to the time of communion. One day, the priest whispered to her that it was okay she could partake. And so she went forward, and she held out her hands, and she received the bread. But then when she turned to walk back to her pew, she panicked. What if it was wrong? What if she shouldn't have taken the bread? And so she slipped the wafer into her pocket. And days later, she slid her hand into her pants pocket and found there the bread, a reminder of her own ambivalence Am I welcome at God's table or not? Perhaps all of us wonder from time to time if God really wants us at the table. We have three reminders in our church that God welcomes every single one of us. We have the Last Supper carving in the parlor. We have the Last Supper carving on the front of this table. And we have the image of Jesus inviting us to the table in the stained glass window that is always over our table. It is specifically to you that God speaks when Jesus says, This is my body, broken for you. And this is the new covenant of God's love poured out for you and for many. Come, the feast is now ready for you and for everyone. Our elder, Marita Smith, leads us in prayer. Loving Spirit, Thank you for this table of bread and wine. We know that in our joyful days and in our dark days, God's love is always manifested here. Thank you for the example of Jesus who taught us that all are welcome at this table. We know that Jesus ate and drank with many who were spurned by polite society and that by doing so, he showed God's love for all. Help us to follow the example of Jesus so that we, too, can bring acceptance and joy to all of God's people. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God.
now receive the Lord's benediction. The good news of the gospel is that all are welcome at God's table. The challenge of the gospel, especially at a time like this, is to let all be welcome at yours. Go in peace. Amen.